in the syllabus, we were scheduled to talk about the endocrine system. Um, but I pivoted last minute because there's more material on the endocrine system that I can fit into one lecture. And this is a general overview. You should see more of this in 152 next semester. Uh, but being that it's flu season now, I thought it's probably a good idea to talk about the lymphatic system or the immune system. The system of defense against invading bacteria and viruses. The system that hopefully keeps you healthy at this point in time when colds are rampant and coughs are being spread everywhere. So we're going to take a quick look at the, um, the soldier cells of the immune system, the white blood cells, and how they mediate the immune response. We are briefly, almost imperceptibly, going to talk about the lymphatic system structures, uh, some of the organs of the lymphatic system and the ducts, or the, the conduits of the lymphatic system, but that's very brief. What we will spend more time on is looking at the innate and adaptive branches of the immune system. So you have right now some protection that's already inherent in your body the innate immunity, but you can also adapt and become resistant to new pathogens and bacteria and strains. We'll look at that. Uh, those are mediated through two different mechanisms, cell-mediated and antibody-mediated immunity. So the last two points are the, the major ones that we're going to focus on. But let's introduce white blood cells as the, the soldiers and the immune response. And if I took a sample of blood out of any one of you and I took all the pieces apart and deconstructed it, it might look like this. The majority is water. The majority of tissue in the body is water. Half of the blood is plasma, which is kind of like a watery, filmy, protein-based solution. Second half is cells. Formed elements are cells. Most of those cells we know of as red blood cells. And then there's some other stuff in there as well. And we don't really care about all of these different percentages at the top or even at the bottom. But what I want to point out are the white blood cells, which make up a really small portion of the formed elements, are all of these items on the right-hand side. Neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, E... e Eosinophils, I can never say that word, basophils, these are the white blood cells, or collectively we call them leukocytes, and these are the cells that will mediate the immune response. They will turn on um, different branches of immunity, they will activate other cells, they will enhance the function of other cells, all in response to invading pathogens or invading bacteria. Pathogens are a broad class of um, invaders that want to do us harm, we'll put it that way. So white blood cells are all of these cells on the right hand side and if you're going to remember one in the lymphatic system, lymphocytes are important. Lymphocytes are what we'll spend most of our time talking about today. Only 20 to 25 percent of the white blood cells are lymphocytes, a small fraction of the cells in the body. Lymphocytes are the things that are activated in cell-mediated immunity and antibody-mediated immunity. These are upregulated or boosted. Their function increases with infections. Normally, their, their function increases with infections, uh, with prolonged illness, they can be reduced. So in uh, immunosuppression, human immunosuppressive virus, HIV, uh, the, immune, uh, the immune system can be suppressed. Specifically, lymphocyte action can be suppressed. But normally, these work to fight off or degrade or destroy invading pathogens. And there are two flavors, well, three flavors of lymphocytes that we'll talk about today first of which are called B cells. B cells are uh, matured in the bone marrow. That's one easy way to remember them. I'll come back to that later. 
these specifically um, secrete antibodies that target bacteria and toxins. B cells are made in the bone marrow and they secrete antibodies that are important in or mitigating invasion by pathogens. We'll see that process in detail coming up. A second flavor are T cells. T cells mature in an organ called the thymus. Thymus, again, we'll come back to that later. The letter in the names of these cells indicates the tissue from which they mature. And T cells specifically engulf or attack invading bacteria. They don't release antibodies. They do the dirty work themselves. These cells will attack the invading bacteria or damaged cells. Much like another kind of lymphocyte called natural killer cells, or NK cells for short. NK cells are a wide variety of cells that will engulf and degrade invading bacteria. So what's the difference then? I just described the same function twice. What's the difference? The differences are that these B and T cells can be upregulated, can be enhanced. We can uh, boost our ability to generate B cells and T cells. They can adapt. Natural killer cells, on the other hand, are part of our innate immune system. We have them, they have a set complement of jobs that they can do, and that doesn't really change. They're a broad category of cell, that is, they attack a broad variety of invading pathogens. B and C cells are specific, and their activity can uh, be modulated based on what viruses we encounter on a daily basis, or what bacteria we encounter on a daily basis. They're modifiable. Now this idea of fighting off bacteria or preventing viruses from infecting our cells is what we consider disease resistance. We do this countless times on a daily basis. Resist the effects of various pathogens invading bacteria generally quite good at it. Disease resistance, resisting the effects of invading pathogens. So let me just say broadly, pathogens are all the microorganisms that might want to invade cells in the body to destroy them, to take over function, to replicate and grow. They want to usurp your body cells' normal functions and take it for their own ends. So pathogens, we call all of these microorganisms are pathogens. Bacteria are some, fungi, viruses, prions, those are different kinds of pathogens. I'll usually just say pathogens in general to mean an invading foreign um, attacker, for lack of a better word. And so we're going to discuss a couple specific ways that we fight off pathogens. But depending on the type of pathogen, there are slightly different mechanisms in place. We're going to talk about a few that are generally, or are general, are broad, that can fight most of these. But there are others that we're not going to address today. So these defenses are automatically upregulated, automatically invoked, and if we have defenses, we have the ability to resist, or we can develop immunity, we can fight off the pathogens. If the pathogens win and we become sick, we are susceptible or immunocompromised. So we want to describe how is immunity generated? How do we resist infection? That's what we're focusing on in this section. We don't want a situation where we are immunocompromised or susceptible. We want to avoid that situation. So we have, like I mentioned earlier, two main branches 
of the uh, lymphatic or the immune system that fight off invading pathogens. The first are classes of broad defenses. We have innate immunity. We have structures that are non-specific. They attack a number of things. Innate immunity is with us our entire lives, and generally it's unchanging. We have it at birth, and these defenses stay with us as we grow through adulthood, and they are protection against a wide range of pathogens, many different classes of pathogens, like the ones that we saw in the last slide. So broad generalists, that's our innate immunity. compared to adaptive immunity, which is specialized. These are the special ops of our immune system. They target specific invaders at specific times to prevent invasion by a specific foreign substance. These can be upregulated when we need them and downregulated when we don't. And importantly, we always keep instructions on hand in case we run into that invader again. So the adaptive immune system is specific and it builds a library in our bodies that we can use to respond effectively down the road if we need to. Both of these are arms of the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system or the immune system. The immune system is really the, it describes the role of the, the pieces of the puzzle, what they are doing, and the lymphatic system is where they are doing that, where this disease resistance is taking place. So let's briefly look at what the lymphatic system is comprised of, and then we'll talk about how uh, immunity is carried out. This is a very broad, very quick look at the lymphatic system. All these blue, or green conduits rather, are parts of the lymphatic system. It's often overlooked. They are separate conduits. They're not arteries. They're not veins. They're not nerves. They often travel in the same general location as those other conduits, but they are specific. They are separate. And the lymphatic system contains fluid that is different from elsewhere in the body called lymph. Lymph is the fluid that's contained within the lymphatic system. It's analogous to blood being contained within the cardiovascular system. And lymph contains white blood cells. Lymph contains lymphocytes. All of the cells or organelles that are involved in the immune response. This is where those cells live normally and they can be mobilized to other parts of the body if they need to be. But they're held within this series of conduits. Lymph is different from other tissue or other fluids in the body. It does bear resemblance to interstitial fluid, or ISF, that you have in your notes, which is just the fluid that exists between cells, not in cells, not in the blood. If you took a tissue out, the cells are um, they're touching, they're close together, but there's some small amount of fluid that spreads around between the cells and an organ or the other rest of the body. Interstitial fluid is what that's called, and it's similar to lymphatic fluid or lymph, but it doesn't contain lymphocytes and those other, uh, other white blood cells. In general terms, the lymphatic system, other than fighting off diseases and pathogens, it helps to maintain fluid balance. Three liters per day of fluid will move from the interstitial fluid through the lymphatic system, and then be dumped back into the blood. So it helps to equalize fluid distribution through the body, which is important for some people. 
This is also the system that absorbs dietary fat. You'll see this when you discuss the digestive system in second semester. But as you take in food, carbohydrates and proteins can go right into the blood, delivered to the liver, and then are processed. Fats go into the lymphatic system. Fats are not directly absorbed into the blood. So this system specifically will absorb fat and the fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin D, E, and K. So there's some auxiliary additional functions of the lymphatic system outside of the role that we're talking about, which is to carry out immune responses, to fight off invading pathogens. So this is where the immune response is carried out. There are other roles of the lymphatic system, but we want to look at, in the next few slides, specifically the immune response. The immune response happens in the lymphatic system, or at least those cells are housed in the lymphatic system, and they can mobilize to other parts of the body, cuts in the skin, different organs if you need to. I guess I'm boring some people. Hmm, that's too bad. Maybe there will be some questions about this on the final exam. Who knows? You can tell them if you want to. So let's talk about the immune responses. The two arms of the, uh, the, the lymphatic system or the immune responses are innate immunity and acquired or uh, adaptive immunity. And the latter has two mechanisms. So innate immunity. Let's talk about that first and foremost. This is the broad class of invader or uh, of, of defense mechanisms. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because it's not so interesting, but there are structures in the body that protect us against a wide variety of pathogens. We are born with this kind of immunity. We get it from our mothers. Things like the skin. The skin is a physical barrier that doesn't allow bacteria and pathogens into the body normally. If it's normal and intact and has all of those four or five layers that we talked about way back in week one or two, Canadian ladies get sun burnt. I remember that, but I don't remember the names. The skin is a physical barrier that prevents bacteria from getting in. And then we have enzymes as well. Some enzymes, or all enzymes, carry out chemical reactions, these enzymes specifically will broadly fight bacteria. So lysozyme is one example. This is an enzyme that's found in saliva, it's found in tears, it's found in mucus, all of those openings or portals where the skin doesn't stop bacteria from coming into the body. Well, in those situations, we have an enzyme that if bacteria gets in, it can break down a lot of different kinds of bacteria. Lysozyme. Maybe I'll ask you, what's that broad antimicrobial agent? Maybe that'll be one of the questions on the final. Lysozyme. Write it down quick. So physical barriers, like the skin and these antimicrobial agents, and then we have internal defenses, like the natural killer cells that we talked about that will chase down bacteria and engulf them and break them down. A natural innate response to invasion is also inflammation or fever. Usually those responses are invoked when cells in the body are infected to help fight off the infection. But that's a natural innate form of immunity. That helps target white blood cells to the places that are infected. Uh, so natural killer cells, uh, phagocytes. Phagocytes are cells that will engulf bacteria and degrade them. And I'm actually going to show you a cool video about that on uh, the next slide here. So these are the kinds of innate immunity responses that we have. Physical barriers, lysozyme as an antibacterial agent, and then some immune cells in the body that have a specific set of functions to fight bacteria. 
So let's look at a white blood cell. Chasing down a bacteria in the interstitial fluid between cells of the body, this is your innate immune system at work. Maybe you've seen this on Reddit the past couple of times. Luckily, this white blood cell is persistent and eventually succeeds. So that process of enveloping the bacteria, that's phagocytosis, to envelop and then degrade the bacteria after it's been caught. That's an example of a broad, nonspecific form of innate immunity. with us when we're born, we carry it through adulthood, and the function remains unchanged. That doesn't explain how we get better at fighting off colds, or what the flu shot's all about. Those are examples of adaptive immunity. Adaptive immunity is a very cool subset of uh, functions in the immune system. Adaptive immunity refers to the body's ability to defend its, itself against specific invaders. Not broad, general pathogens, but specific targets. We can recognize those specific targets, we mount a response against those specific targets, and we keep instructions on how to do that again in future if we run into that specific target down the road. So we have specificity. That we're looking for a specific target is specificity. And then the second characteristic I described is memory. Creating a library that allows us to ramp up our response in future. A more quick, more robust response in future. Now I've talked about um, pathogens a fair bit as the broad class of invading uh, bacteria, viruses, fungi, etc. Um, what we recognize about those pathogens are antigens. They're little markers on the surface of the invaders that we identify. Antigens are uh, antibody generators. It's a short form of antibody generators. Like Tethics, if you watch Silicon Valley Tech Ethics. Antibody generators. So let's, um, let's watch a few short clips to, to see how this all comes together because videos do a far better job at showing you this response than I can by describing it. Our skin and mucous membrane smoke a bunch of barrier against invasion of foreign agents. If damage to our skin occurs, local defense mechanisms mount the initial attack on invaders. If deeper penetration of pathogens occurs, the adaptive immune system relies on lymphocytes to provide a two-pronged attack on invaders and infected body cells. One response, cell-mediated immunity, occurs when T lymphocytes directly attack and destroy diseased or foreign cells. The other process, antibody-mediated immunity, does not involve direct lymphocyte destruction of invaders. Instead, B lymphocytes release antibodies into the blood and interstitial fluid to neutralize pathogens. T lymphocytes mature in the thymus to become either cytotoxic T cells, which directly attacks diseased or foreign cells, or helper T cells. Helper T cells aid the immune responses of both cell mediated and antibody mediated immunity. B lymphocytes mature in the bone marrow to become plasma cells, which produce antibodies. During the maturation process, these lymphocytes develop the ability to carry out adaptive immune responses through the insertion of distinctive proteins, called antigen receptors, into their plasma membranes. B lymphocytes, when activated by the secretions of helper T cells, divide by a process called clonal selection into antibody-producing plasma cells and B memory cells. Cytotoxic T cells are similarly able to clone themselves into active cells 
and liver cells. Helper T cells have a central role in the immune response by releasing stimulatory molecules known as interleukins. These interleukins greatly increase the cloning of plasma cells to stimulate a high production of specific antibodies and cytotoxic T cells to attack invaded cells. The number of memory cells also increase substantially. Most active cells eventually die after the immune response has been completed. Memory cells remain inactive and take the same pathogen as in the body at a later time. This enables them to rapidly respond to the next invasion. Okay, we added a lot of detail there. Let's catch up. B cells and T cells are really important in this response are really important in mediating the effects or of uh, adaptive immunity. So they are named for the tissues in which they mature. T cells mature or become what's called immunocompetent. Immunocompetent, they have competence in, or, uh, in, in conferring immune responses. In the thymus, B cells in the bone marrow, and then the video added a lot more detail. It's not just two types of cells, but there are some specific types, helper T cells, cytotoxic T cells, and plasma cells that are invoked in this response. Cytotoxic T cells, we will see are the cells that mediate cell-mediated immunity. Cytotoxic T cells are responsible for the cell-mediated immunity branch of adaptive immunity. Plasma cells are responsible for antibody-mediated immunity. So cytotoxic T cells do cell-mediated immunity. Plasma cells do antibody mediated immunity. And there's no really easy way to remember that other than to just remember it. What I'm not mentioned is helper T cells. And this is asterisk because they are somewhat special. They turn on the other cells. Like you saw in the video with the interleukin secretions, the signals being sent, they upregulate or activate cytotoxic T cells or plasma cells. Cytotoxic T cells and plasma cells. These are the active forms that respond to an invading pathogen. Helper T cells just augment their response or turn them on. Part of turning them on, one, do your job and go fight that pathogen, Part of turning them on is to also create a copy or a memory cell. This is that library that we're creating in the adaptive immune system. The memory cells will retain information about the invader so that in future, if we need to produce more cytotoxic T cells to target that specific invader, we can. all because helper T cells have activated this system. Helper T cells initiate the response. Now that process I've described is what was called clonal selection. Clonal selection. The propagation and division of B cells or T cells. At first, there aren't many. We don't have many T cells for a specific pathogen. We don't have many B cells that would release antibodies. There are very few of them until helper T cells activate them through clonal selection. Clonal selection is the process by which that limited number of cells divides and proliferates and becomes more numerous. Clonal selection is helper T cells saying, 
you will be really good at fighting off this pathogen. I need more of you. I'm activating clonal selection. Now I have more of the active cells and more memory cells. So it creates a pool of lymphocytes. We now have many active cells. Many, uh, they're also called effector cells. Kind of like in, in the nervous side, effector signals. Um, we're heading out to do a job. Affector or afferent information was returning sensory information. Active cells are effector cells and memory cells. That complement, that combined influence, allows us to fight off the pathogen and then keep the instructions on hand in case that invades again in the future. What we want to see now is how. How is that invader targeted? And how do we fight it off? Pathogens such as bacterial cells or even cellular components that are recognized as foreign provoke immune responses and are called antigens. Small parts of a large antigen molecule called epitopes act as the triggers for immune responses. Each epitope on an antigen can activate a specific T cell or induce production of a specific antibody from a T cell to target different antigens on a single pathogen. An amazing feature of the antigen receptors on both T and T cells is its ability to recognize and bind to a group of billions of these epitopes. The T and B cells are able to differentiate between healthy and diseased body cells or foreign cells because all body cells, except for erythrocytes, produce a membrane marker known as the major histocompatibility complex 1, or MHC1. <coughs> when a body cell becomes infected by a pathogen, the pathogen's antigens add to the MHC1 marker, creating a signal that targets the infected cell for destruction by immune cells. If the pathogen has not invaded the body cell, defensive cells, including B lymphocytes, phagocytes, and dendritic cells, known as antigen-presenting cells, or APCs, consume and digest the invaders. Fragments of the pathogenic antigen are attached to a second version of the MHC identifier, MHC2, which is inserted in the APC's cell membrane. These cells expose the antigen in a way that activates helper T cells, which in turn promote a higher level of adaptive immune response. So this is how do we recognize an invader? This is how, if you've seen a movie and a patient rejects an organ transplant, this is how that's mediated. We have this marker on all the cells of our body, or most of the cells, that is a self-antigen that identifies it as yours. And then other cells don't have other cells don't have that. Other cells have different markers, different flags, different proteins. So we can tell that they're not ours. And then we target them for the adaptive immune response. So how do we signal lymphocytes to target invading pathogens? We mark them. We mark them. Whatever the pathogen is, we break off a piece of that pathogen. If it's infected a cell, it's presented on the outside of the cell as a flag, waving to say, I've been infected. I need something to come and fix me. I need the immune response to prevent this from spreading. If a cell's been infected, it presents that marker as a flag. If a cell's not been infected, there are specialized immune cells, the APCs, that will do that. They say, this is a bacteria. In order for there to be an immune response, I need to break that down and then show the immune system what cells to activate. In both cases, you're mounting part of the invader on a normal protein 
So we recognize that it's changed. It's different. We recognize that we need to have some immune response targeting in that specific location. Now, the, the name of that protein is long, the major histocompatibility complex. That's just a self antigen. It's a marker to identify uh, a cell as part of your body. Just remember MHCs. MHC. You don't have to remember major histocompatibility complex. If I write that on the exam, I'll have both. That's the platform. That's the stage or the flagpole where we present the invading bacteria for analysis. Now, up until this point, we're only dealing with, do we need a response? Now that we're waving that flag, we can get a response. The response to that invasion can be one of two things. We can either destroy the cell, cell-mediated immunity will destroy an infected cell. If the cell's been infected and it's waving the flag, then helper T cells will send cytotoxic T cells to destroy the cell. If it's another white blood cell waving the flag, we will get B cells to send out antibodies. You see what antibodies do, but it's, it's slightly different than destroying the cell completely. Antibody or immunoglobin mediated immunity, those two things mean the same thing. Antibodies are immunoglobins. They're one and the same. B cells will release them to target a specific flag being waved by other white blood cells so that we can disrupt them, destroy them, get rid of the invading pathogen. How do we destroy the cell? How do we release antibodies? <coughs> you know, the easiest way, I'm just going to jump to this video because this is more convincing. When a cytotoxic T cell is activated by the actions of A, B, C, and helper T cells, it recognizes the MHC1 complexes on the infected body cell surface. Cytotoxic T cells then release two molecules, perforin and granzyme, in order to destroy the infected body cells and the pathogens that infect them. Perforin creates pores in the target cell membrane. The pores allow extracellular fluid to enter the cell, causing it to swell and potentially rupture the cell membrane. Granzyme then enters through the pores and causes the degradation of its proteins to ensure cell death. Cloned B cells do not attach individual cells. Instead, after they become plasma cells, they greatly increase their production of antibodies. These antibodies are released into the plasma and extracellular fluid where they will match and bond to the target antigen. Antibodies are Y-shaped structures with unique antigen-binding sites on the tips of two of the arms. This allows an antibody to perform different functions depending on the type of binding site it possesses. They may essentially prevent invaders from interacting with normal body cells, or mark foreign cells for destruction, and activate our defensive cells with a specific action. So, we destroy the invader in one of two ways. We either open up holes in the membrane, cytotoxic T cells see the flag, they release proteins that will pop open a hole in that cell membrane and then release an enzyme in that will break it apart. A process called apoptosis. 
the apoptosis is programmed cell death. The enzyme runs in, it starts the self-destruct sequence, and then the cell disintegrates, which is good because now there's no machinery for the bacteria to take over. It can't spread. And as the cell disintegrates, the microbes or the invaders that were taking over the normal cell function, they're targeted for breakdown by natural killer cells and other phagocytes. They're engulfed, just like that video that we saw. Engulfed and broken down. So that's what cytotoxic T cells do. B cells are slightly different. Given that we have a few minutes left, I'm going to skip the lengthy discussion of the steps, but you saw B cells releasing antibodies. Antibodies will target that cell for engulfing and destruction, just like um, we saw here. The point about antibodies that I want to get across is two slides down. Antibodies are sensed by the immune system, and their targets will be degraded. Initially, there's very little response. If something invades your body, few antibodies are released, because we don't have many plasma cells to respond accordingly. We get a small blip, a small production of antibodies, and that's what this graph is measuring. This is the amount of antibodies that are circulating in the blood amount of immunoglobins that are circulating in the blood. Remember, those two mean the same thing. These two lines are just different kinds of antibodies. This is IgM and IgG. They're just different names, different kinds of immunoglobins, two different kinds of antibodies. Where normally we get one small blip and a little response, after we produce many plasma cells and their associated memory cells, we have a much greater capacity to respond in future. 28 days later, four weeks later, if the same pathogen invades and warrants a release of antibodies, look at the hundredfold difference in release. This is hundreds of millions of antibodies being released into circulation from the lymphatic system, circulating through the blood, binding to all the pathogens they find, targeting them for degradation. This isn't a linear scale either. Notice this is a, a log scale. We have 10, 100, to the power of 10 by each deviation. So orders of magnitude larger response after we generate uh, the memory cells from that initial response. I'll finish with four points, and then I'll put the summary online like I did for the muscle section, because we're not going to have time. Four classes of responses of the immune system. What we've described today is a natural active immunity. What the body does in response to an invader without any help from the outside is natural active immunity. B cells and T cells are turned on and we hope that they target the invaders to destroy them. That's a complement to our natural passive immunity the innate immunity that was transferred from mother to child as you grow and develop in the womb and then are born and receive the breastfeed, your mother shares her own complement, her instructions, her library with you. That becomes part of our passive immunity without any external help. But we are smart enough as a species that we've been able to boost this response. We can create a situation 
where the immune system is challenged, where it develops memory cells, and therefore can fight an invasion in future more effectively. Artificial active immunity is the flu shot. An inactivated virus is injected into the body with antigens that can be identified. We create new memory cells and new plasma cells. We add to our library. So if we get an active form of that virus that invades in future, we can now release thousands of times more antibodies than we would have and effectively fight it off. We've had to help it externally by providing the flu shot. That's why it's artificial, but we've boosted our library accordingly. Similarly, for those individuals that are immunocompromised, that don't have a um, satisfactory innate immune system, we can give them antibodies directly. We can infuse immunoglobins or antibodies for those that are immunosuppressed intravenously, and they have the tools to fight off an infection. We as a species are smart enough that we've figured out how to do that artificially. Not that they're damaging, not that they're bad for you. This is a natural enhancement of the body's natural defenses. So four different types of immune response. Are they active or passive? Are they natural or artificial? So what we generally discussed today. I'll put the, sum uh, the summary up online for you in a new document. If you haven't found the one on muscle, the muscle series of slides has the summary in at the end of it. I'll repost these slides on Moodle with the summary slide so that you can view it at your leisure. Best of luck studying. And remember, no physical class on Friday.